Albert Smith was born in 1867 in Cowling, Yorkshire, to parents Leeming and Martha Smith. He grew up with a strong sense of justice and fairness, which would later lead him to become an important figure in the trade union movement. As a young man, Smith became involved in the Cole and Nelson Overlookers Associations, where he served as both vice president and secretary. Through his work with these organizations, he gained a reputation as a tireless advocate for workers' rights and fair labor practices. In 1908, Smith was elected as an alderman in Nelson, and two years later he became the town's mayor. During his time in office, he worked tirelessly to improve living conditions for working class families and to secure better wages and benefits for workers throughout the region. In 1910, Smith took his commitment to social justice to the national stage when he was elected to the House of Commons as the Member of Parliament for the Clitheroe Division of Lancashire that governed Nelson and Colne. Over the next eight years, he worked tirelessly to represent his constituents' interests and to advance the cause of labor rights throughout the country. But despite his success in Parliament, Smith never lost sight of his roots in the trade union movement. In 1920, he resigned his seat in order to take up a full-time post as a trade union official, accepting appointment as steward of the Manor of Northstead as a procedural device to effect his resignation. For the rest of his life, he remained a tireless advocate for working class people and a champion of social justice. When Albert Smith passed away in 1942, he left behind a legacy of dedicated service to the people of Nelson and Lancashire. His work in Parliament and the trade union movement had helped to improve the lives of countless people, and his commitment to fairness and equality had inspired a generation of activists to continue the fight for social justice. Robinson Graham had always been a fighter. As a young man growing up in Burnley, he had watched his parents struggle to make ends meet as weavers, and he had vowed to do something to improve the lives of workers like them. So it was no surprise when he became active in the Burnley Weavers Association, working his way up from a rank and file member to the position of assistant secretary. He was a tireless campaigner for better pay and conditions, and he quickly gained a reputation as a skilled negotiator. In 1920, when the opportunity arose to run for parliament as a Labour candidate in the Nelson and Colne by election, Graham jumped at the chance. He was a natural campaigner, and his message of solidarity with the working class resonated with voters. To everyone's surprise, he won the election by a narrow margin. But things quickly went sour when he clashed with the United Textile Factory Workers Association, which had sponsored his candidacy. They accused him of being too moderate, and demanded that he toe the line on their demands. Graham refused to be bullied, and he also fell out with the Labour Party leadership, who he felt were not doing enough to support the workers. Under intense pressure, he reluctantly stood down at the 1920 to general election, but he continued to fight for workers' rights as a trade unionist. For the next 25 years, Robinson Graham devoted himself to his work at the Burnley Weavers Association rising to the position of secretary in 1941. He was a respected leader, known for his integrity and his commitment to his members. When he died in 1953, the people of Burnley mourned the passing of a great man. Robinson Graham had fought all his life for the rights of the working class, and he had left a legacy that would continue to inspire generations to come. Arthur Greenwood was a man of great passion and determination. He had always been interested in politics and social issues from a young age, and he believed that change could only come about through action. He was a committed member of the Labour Party and had dedicated his life to public service. Born in Hunslet, Leeds, in 1880, Greenwood was the son of a painter and decorator. He attended the Yorkshire College and obtained a B.Sc after which he worked for a time as a teacher. But politics was his true calling, and he soon became involved in the Labour Party. In 1922, 
He was elected to the House of Commons as the MP for Nelson and Cole in Lancashire. He quickly made a name for himself as a diligent and hard-working member of Parliament, and in 1929, he was appointed Minister of Health by Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald. As Minister of Health, Greenwood implemented a number of important reforms, including raising widows' pensions and enacting a large-scale slum clearance program through the Housing Act of 1930. However, his time in office was cut short when the Labour government collapsed in 1931. Greenwood continued to serve in Parliament, and in 1935, he was appointed deputy leader of the Labour Party under Clement Attlee. During the campaign for the 1935 general election, he became known for his outspoken opposition to the rearmament policy of Chancellor of the Exchequer Neville Chamberlain, which he called, the merest scaremongering. But it was in 1940, during the darkest days of World War II, that Greenwood truly made his mark on history. On May 10, 1940, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Great Britain just as the German army was sweeping through France and threatening to invade Britain. Churchill's first priority was to rally the nation and convince them that Britain could still win the war. Greenwood played a crucial role in this effort when, on June 4, 1940, he gave a powerful speech in the House of Commons in which he affirmed Britain's commitment to continue fighting Nazi Germany. As he spoke, Greenwood was interrupted by an angry conservative backbencher. Leo Amory, who shouted, Speak for England, Arthur. This electrified the chamber, and Greenwood rose to the occasion, denouncing Chamberlain's policies and reaffirming Britain's resolve to fight on. Greenwood's speech was widely acclaimed as one of the most important moments in the history of British democracy. It helped to galvanize the nation and to inspire the people to endure the long, hard years of war that lay ahead. Arthur Greenwood continued to serve in Parliament until his death in 1954. He had dedicated his life to the service of his country and to the cause of social justice, and he had made an indelible mark on the history of Britain. His legacy lives on today, as an inspiration to all those who believe in the power of political action to bring about positive change. Linton Theodore Thorpe Nelson and Colne at the 1929 general election. Linton Theodore Thorpe was a man of many talents. He was a successful barrister, a respected judge, and an active member of the Conservative Party. He was also a man with strong principles, and he was not afraid to stand up for what he believed in, even if it meant going against his own party. Thorpe's political career began in 1929 when he stood for the Conservative Party in the Nelson and Colne constituency. Although he was unsuccessful, he refused to give up on his political ambitions. In 1931, he stood again and this time he won the seat. Thorpe quickly became known for his independent streak. In 1935, he resigned from the national government whip along with several other MPs who were unhappy with the government's policies on India and what they saw as a move towards socialism. However, Thorpe continued to identify himself as a conservative. Thorpe's decision to resign the whip did not go unnoticed by his constituents. Many of them admired his principles and his willingness to stand up for what he believed in. However, others were less impressed and Thorpe faced a tough fight in the 1935 general election. Despite his popularity, Thorpe lost his seat as an independent conservative. Undeterred, he decided to stand again, this time with the backing of the pro-Nazi Liberty Restoration League in the Farnham by election in 1937. Thorpe's decision to stand with the backing of a pro-Nazi group was controversial, to say the least. Many people were outraged, and Thorpe's reputation suffered as a result. He lost the election, and his political career was effectively over. In later years, Thorpe returned to his legal career, serving as the recorder of Saffron Walden and Malden until his death in 1950. Despite the controversies of his political career, he remained a respected judge and a man of great principle. Today, 
Linton Theodore Thorpe is remembered as a man who was not afraid to stand up for what he believed in, even if it meant going against the tide. His legacy is one of independence, integrity, and a commitment to his principles, even in the face of adversity. Sidney Silverman, born in a poor family in Liverpool, was a highly intelligent student who obtained scholarships to study at top universities but chose to study English literature at the University of Liverpool. He was a pacifist and conscientious objector during the First World War, which led to him serving multiple prison sentences. He later became a solicitor in Liverpool and developed a reputation for defending the interests of the poor. He married Nancy Rubinstein and had three sons. As a member of the Labour Party, Silverman was elected as a city councillor and then to the House of Commons in 1935. He was a vocal opponent of Oswald Mosley and the British Union of Fascists, supporting the Public Order Act of 1936. Silverman initially held pacifist views but changed his stance when he learned about the atrocities being committed against Jews in Nazi Germany. When the Labour Party won the 1945 general election, Silverman was expected to be offered a job in the new government but was not due to his strong left-wing opinions. He was highly critical of Ernest Bevin's handling of relations with the Soviet Union. Silverman was a strong opponent of capital punishment and managed to persuade the House of Commons to agree to a five-year suspension of executions in 1948. He later founded the Campaign for the Abolition of the Death Penalty and published a book called Hanged and Innocent. In 1953. In 1954, Silverman and Michael Foote were expelled from the Labour Party for opposing its nuclear defence policy. Three years later, he joined with Kingsley Martin, editor of the New Statesman, to found the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Silverman remained a member of Parliament for Nelson and Colne until his death in 1968. His legacy as a social reformer and advocate for penal and political reform lives on. David Waddington was born in Burnley, Lancashire, the youngest of five children, to a family of solicitors. He attended Cressbrook School and Sedb School, both independent schools, and later Hartford College. Oxford, where he became president of the Oxford University Conservative Association. Waddington was called to the bar at Gray's Inn in 1951, and he was known for being a successful barrister, defending several high-profile cases. Waddington had a long and distinguished political career. He stood for election several times before being successful and he was first elected to Parliament in 1968 at the Nelson and Colne by election, caused by the death of Labour MP Sidney Silverman. He was re-elected there in 1970 and in February 1974, but lost his seat at the October 1970 for general election by a margin of 669 votes to Labour's Doug Hoyle. Waddington returned to Parliament for Clitheroe by election in March 1979 and was subsequently elected for the broadly similar Ribble Valley constituency in 1983. He served as Chief Whip under Margaret Thatcher, then as Home Secretary and finally as Leader of the House of Lords under John Major. Waddington also served as the Governor of Bermuda between 1992 and 1997. He was a member of the Conservative Party throughout his political career and he was made a life peer in the House of Lords after his retirement from the House of Commons. Despite his many achievements, Waddington was known for his humility and his willingness to help others. He was highly respected by his colleagues, both in Parliament and in the legal profession. Waddington passed away on 23rd of February 2017, at the age of 87. Doug Hoyle had always been a man of the people. Born in a small town in northern England, he knew the struggles that everyday people faced, and he was determined to fight for their rights. He became involved in politics at a young age, and soon found himself rising through the ranks of the Labour Party. In 1974, he was elected as the MP for Nelson and Cole, 
marking the first labor gain of that year's general election. He quickly gained a reputation as a hard-working and dedicated representative, fighting for the interests of his constituents and working to improve their lives. But Doug's political career was not without its challenges. He narrowly lost his seat in 1979, and faced a tough battle to regain it in 1981. This time, he was successful, defeating a strong challenge from Roy Jenkins to become the MP for Warrington North. Doug's dedication to his constituents did not go unnoticed. In 1992, he was appointed chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party, a position he held until 1997. During his time in this role, he worked tirelessly to bring the party together and ensure that it was united in its goals. In 1997, Doug made the difficult decision to step down from the House of Commons. But he was not ready to retire from public life just yet. Instead, he was appointed as a Lord in Waiting, a position he held until 1999. Throughout his career, Doug remained committed to serving the people of Warrington. He served as chairman of the Warrington Wolves Rugby League Club, and was a non executive director of the local employer, Debt Free Direct. He was also a strong supporter of Gibraltar and was awarded both the Freedom of Gibraltar and the Gibraltar Medallion of Honor. Doug's dedication to public service was a source of inspiration for many, including his son, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, who followed in his father's footsteps to become an MP and Speaker of the House of Commons. Doug may have retired from politics, but his legacy lives on, and he will always be remembered as a champion of the people. John Lee, Baron Lee of Trafford, had always been a driven and ambitious man. From a young age, he had a passion for politics, and he knew that he wanted to make a difference in the world. Growing up in Manchester, John was raised in a working class family. His parents had always instilled in him the values of hard work and determination, and he carried those values with him throughout his life. After completing his education, John decided to enter politics. He ran for office as a Conservative and was elected to Parliament in 1979, representing the Nelson and Colne constituency. He quickly rose through the ranks and was appointed to several ministerial positions, including Junior Minister for Defence Procurement and Minister for Tourism. Despite his successes, John found himself increasingly disillusioned with the Conservative Party's direction. He felt that the party was moving away from its core values and was becoming too focused on the interests of the wealthy. In 2001, John made the difficult decision to leave the Conservative Party and join the Liberal Democrats. It was a move that would change the course of his career and his life. In 2006, John was made a life appear and given the title of Baron Lee of Trafford. He quickly established himself as a leading voice in the House of Lords and he used his position to fight for the causes that he believed in. Outside of politics, John remained just as active. He served as chairman of the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions and was a deputy lieutenant of Greater Manchester. He was also a successful investor and author, publishing several books on his investment strategies. Throughout his life, John never forgot his roots. He remained committed to his values of hard work and determination, and he used his success to give back to his community. He served on the Council of the National Youth Agency and was a patron of ShareSoc, which represents individual shareholders in the UK. John passed away in 2022 at the age of 80, leaving behind a legacy of hard work, dedication, and service to others. His contributions to politics and his community will be remembered for years to come, and his influence will continue to inspire generations of leaders to come. Gordon Prentice had always been interested in politics. He had been a leader of Hammersmith and Fulham Council before being elected as the Member of Parliament, MP, for Pendle in Lancashire in 1992. He was a member of the Labour Party and served as an MP until 2010. As a young man, 
Gordon had been educated at the independent George Heriot School in Edinburgh and had gone on to study at the University of Glasgow, where he received an MA in politics and economics in 1975. He was also the president of the union. After completing his studies, he worked for the Labour Party Policy Directorate from 1982 to 1992. Gordon's political career was varied and interesting. He introduced a right to Rome bill as a private member's bill in 1999, which became law as the Countryside and Rights of Way Act 2000. He campaigned against fox hunting, and in 2000, he organized hustings for the election of the Speaker of the House of Commons. However, Gordon was not always popular with his colleagues. He was one of the few Labour MPs not to endorse Gordon Brown for the 2007 Labour leadership, instead nominating left-winger John McDonnell. The following year, he called for Brown to resign. Despite this, Gordon continued to work hard for his constituents. He was a member of Parliament's Public Administration Committee and called for tax exiled peers to be removed from the House of Lords. He also spoke out against the proposed merger of Lancashire Constabulary with Cumbria Constabulary. Gordon lost his seat at the 2010 election and announced that he would not stand at the next election. He felt that he had done all he could for his constituents and wanted to spend more time with his family. After leaving politics, Gordon remained active in the community, volunteering for various charities and organizations. Throughout his career, Gordon had always been passionate about politics and had worked hard to make a difference. He may not have always been popular, but he was respected for his dedication and commitment. Andrew Stevenson had always known that he wanted to be a politician. As a teenager, he was already a member of the Conservative Party and served two terms on the National Executive of Conservative Future. In 2010, his dream came true when he was elected as the Member of Parliament for Pendle in Lancashire. Andrew was born in Manchester in 1981, the son of Malcolm and Dan Stevenson. His father and grandfather had worked for British Rail, but the family had moved to the northwest in the 1960s. Andrew attended Poynton High School, a state comprehensive school, and was the first in his family to go to university. He studied for a degree in management studies at Royal Holloway, University of London, and graduated in 2002. While at school, Andrew had wanted to become a chef. He took part in the South Trafford College Super Chef Competition, was awarded a bronze medal in the Northern Salon Culinary Competition, and participated in the Northwest Regional Finals of BBC Junior Master Chef. However, he decided to pursue a career in politics instead. After graduating from university, Andrew worked as an insurance broker and later as a partner at Stevenson and Threader. He was a councillor for Macclesfield Borough Council from 2003 to 2007 and at the age of 25, he became the chair of the Titton Conservative Association, the youngest person to lead a local conservative association. He was selected as the prospective parliamentary candidate, PPC, for Pendle in September 2006. As an MP, Andrew was appointed to various roles within the government, including Minister of State for Africa and International Development and Minister of State for Transport. He was also appointed as co-chairman of the Conservative Party and Minister Without Portfolio, attending cabinet, in the caretaker government of Boris Johnson. Andrew worked hard in these roles, always putting his constituents first and advocating for the policies that he believed in. In October 2022, Andrew was appointed as Lord Commissioner of the Treasury, a position he was proud to hold. He continued to work hard for his constituents and for the country, always striving to make a difference. Andrew knew that being a politician was not easy but he believed that it was worth it if he could make a positive impact on people's lives.